have a new topic. Uh, the planning technique to denoise electromyogram artifacts from signal channel electroencephalogram, which is EEG in short. So the previous presentation I did earlier, it was completely on different domain. It was in computer vision image domain. Now I'll be talking on signal processing domain. So um, you all know that uh, EEG is taken from the um, brain neurons and uh, EMG can be coming from any muscles and our bodies are full of muscles. So uh, today's this talk is uh, related to only how we can remove the muscle artifacts from the EEG data. And I'm showing this for single channel, but it can be applied for any number of channels. And uh, this is the first deep learning uh, related work, actually. There is no deep learning work in this domain. So my presentation outlined, uh, I will talk about a little bit of introduction and research problem and the data set, uh, and then uh, what is our experimental pipeline. And then I will be discussing the details of the experiment and result, and then I'll conclude my study. Now let's see the introduction. So we all know about um, electroencephalogram, how it captures the brain activity. Um, and it can significantly significantly helps in detecting epileptic seizure, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and in a lot of other neurological problems from the EEG you can collect. And also, uh, nowadays, people are also looking in brain computer interface, cognitive load, biometric system development, in a lot of different applications, people are using EEG nowadays. Okay, so um, EEG um, has potential, at the same time, EEG is very susceptible to the different forms of artifact. For example, electrooculogram, our eye movement causes artifact to the EEG signal. Our muscle activations in the hand and the facial muscles actually cause the artifact to the EMG, uh, sorry, EEG. And, um, and also our cardiac signal, heart signal travels to the brain as well. So it is also available in the, some of the channels, especially for the wearable biosensors. So this uh, EEG signal correction become very important for the clinician because if you are uh, going to treat the patient based on the EEG data and the, if the data has some other artifacts, you might consider that as Caesar, for example, epileptic Caesar, but actually it's not Caesar, it's actually just an artifact. So it, it is very important. Uh, in previous, all the work, like 20, last 20, 30, 50 years, people have been working on different signal processing technique to remove the artifacts. But the problem is, um, if you model the artifact, you might model one type of artifact, or you mix some other artifacts, but you cannot really model the real world scenarios. And that is the challenge. Because in real world, maybe different types of artifact will be mixed together in on the data. So. Um, among those different types of artifact, we found the uh, electrooculogram, the ocular artifact. It is very uh, clear because you know when the eye movement, ball movements, there is specific spike come in the signal, and the amplitude is quite big, and it, it is very clear, evident. And ECG has a specific pattern by looking at the R peaks of the ECG, you can identify that okay, this is the ECG artifacts. But the EMG artifact that is very very uh, like a difficult to identify because uh, it, it has a burst of signal like voice signal, sound signal, and that can corrupt completely ECG signal because uh, sorry EEG signal because EMG artifact has higher amplitude and it has longer uh, like bandwidth. So, so having a, we should have some very robust technique or deep learning technique which can identify these EM, EMG artifacts. Um, and there was no such thing. Uh, so that's why we've been working. And I'm, I'm sharing only a part of my work here. We submitted a paper where we um, uh, proposed multiple different uh, artifacts in mobile technique, but I'm uh, only showing here EMG artifact in mobile, but we can remove any form of artifacts. So the data set we have used is a publicly available data set. Um, and it's just recently made public level. And there's a group who created this data set. They named it uh, EEG Denoise Net based on their model. They uh, named the data set. Uh, and the, you know, how they created the data set, quite uh, interesting. You can see there are plenty of good quality EEG data available in the uh, public domain, like uh, PhysioNet, IEEE data port, Nature data port. 
uh, like nature scientific data. The, all these places, there are plenty of good quality data available and collected with a very good um, like um, protocol. So you know exactly how doctor or the researcher collected it. So we got, uh, they got actually 4,514 clean EEG segments from all individual patients. And these data was filtered with a 50 hertz notch filter, like a power line frequency removed. And then the band was filtered it to 1 to 80 hertz. So this is for the EEG. Whereas the EMG, they had 5,598 clean EMG segments from different studies. And um, that is also filtered uh, with a 50 hertz line frequency. And also band was filtered is a, with a little bit higher bandwidth because EMG has higher bandwidth than EEG, we all know. So muscle signal has higher bandwidth. So uh, then we said each of these signal has a specific segment length. The signal has a length of two seconds and they have different sampling frequency. Uh, one uh, EEG is 256 and EMG was 512 because he has, EMG has more bandwidth, so it has to be sampled with higher number of sampling frequency. Now, um, so if I show you an example, this is the clean EEG segments. And you can, you can segment, you can see here, it is uh, roughly around a uh, few hundred microvolt. So it's a very tiny signal and a very low amplitude signal. And that's why it's very susceptible to noise. Any form of artifact can corrupt it entirely. Whereas the EMG signal, if you look at this one, it is a few thousand microvolt. So in other words, you can say a few millivolt. So it's quite big signal. And see the nature of the burst of the signal. When the muscle activates, our muscle produces this kind of burst in nature of signals, multiple muscles. Um, uh, this is muscles, but uh, I'm talking about MUP, uh, individual neural level signals combined together to get this muscle signal. So, so you can see this um, muscle if signal, if you superimposed on this one, which is very tiny signal, then you cannot identify where is the EEG data. It's very challenging uh, to re retrieve the signal, original signal. So, so what we did, we take the EEG segment, we take the EMG segment, they are independent from different users, but they are real data. They are not artificial data, but real data. What we did, we linearly mix them. Like um, I have the EG data, then I mix EMG with it, with different amount of SNR, like a different amount of signal attribution level. So we mix and we create artificially corrupted EG data by only EMG, because, uh, because we have EMG and EG. So we corrupted them. We corrupt the EG data by the EMG data. And then this data set, we split into train, validation, and test set. 80%, for example, training, 20% of the training uh, as validation, and the remaining 20% of the full data set is test set. So it's a completely independent set, and validation at train set is the 80%, and validation is also part of the train, is also independent. And we all know how, why we use validation. It is for fine-tuning the deep learning model, like a hyperparameter tuning and validation. So once we select, we train the model with the training data set, we hyperparameter, uh, we tune the hyperparameter with the validation set and finalize the uh, best model. And that best model we test on the test set. And then we, we got the clean ECG signal uh, predicted version. And we also have ground truth signal from our data. And then we compare how well we managed to retrieve the signal. So we use some specific performance matrices to measure our performance. So let's um, see how we mix the signal, then we go to the result section. Um, so see here, we contaminate the EEG signal with EMG, the different amount of SNR, like minus seven dB means very bad quality EMG signal, very high noise, whereas two dB is a less number of noise. So uh, we want to see extent of variation because EMG, uh, we don't know in real world how, what will be the extent of noise. So we modify the noise and add it with the EG in this way. So Y equal to X plus Lambda N. Lambda is the scaling factor. N is the noise coming from X is the original EG signal. So N is the EMG signal. 
lambda is the scaling factor, x is the EG sigma, and that's the combined, like the artificial EMG corrupted EG sigma. So, and then um, SNR was calculated from this RMS of x, which is the original EG, um, RMS of lambda n, which is the uh, like a scaled version of the EMG. So we calculated this SNR, and this SNR is actually minus seven to two, this one. So we took all the EEG samples, but to match with the number of EEG sample, we take for, randomly for same number of EMG, because you have to make it one-to-one. -one. Uh, we don't want to replicate anything. So we have to make one-to-one. -one. So uh, 10 SNL level, minus seven, all the way zero, then one, two. So 10 different SNL level we investigated. And um, of course we have EMG contaminated EEG, and also ground truth EEG because we created it. Now we then split, as I said, and we do five-fold cross-validation for machine learning. Now, see the signal. This green one is the original ground truth EEG. It's uh, quite clean, you can see. It's very clean signal. Whereas the red one is the EMG contaminated EEG signal. And uh, these EMG are actually real-world EMG. So this is the artificial one we created, but created with the original things. Now, if we just zoom in this portion, because these portions are not that challenging, because there is no that much artifact here. And this portion is very challenging portion. So if you zoom that part, you can see uh, how corrupted now your EEG data. And if any doctor get this data, you cannot understand what is happening here actually. So they need to have a clean data. So that's our objective. So. We trained four different 1D CNN convolutional neural network, but this is a special type of neural network. We call it segmentation network. And these segmentation networks are typically people uh, use UNET. It's a very popular one for because of the U architecture uh, for segmentation model. So we take five, four different architecture. One is called FPN, feature, uh, pyramid network. FPN is very popular and the unit is also very popular. Um, and the other one is another version of UNET, which is multi-level context gating unit, MCG unit, and LinkNet is another version of UNET, but late, late, latest version of UNET. So these four different algorithms, which is available in the literature, we take them, their architecture, and then train on our data set. And use some training parameter, like when you are training a machine learning model, you need to select some loss function. So you use mean square error as loss function. And we need, because every machine learning algorithm is an optimization problem, we need to optimize it. So you know, we use Adam optimizer, you know, stochastic gradient descent or Adam is very popular. Adam is the most popular one nowadays. So use Adam. And when you're training a machine learning algorithm, you need to specify the learning rate, how fast or slow your model will learn. So this is the learning rate. So we um, we train the algorithm in Google Colab Pro environment. It's a paid version of Colab. Where, where you can have virtual memory, you can have uh, virtual space to train your model uh, from Google. Okay, so we did the five full class validation and train, test, and validate all four models uh, independently. So for for uh, for the investigation purpose, we do two experiments. One experiment was done on SNR wise split. SNR wise split means, uh, as I said, we have. 4,514 signal, EEG signal. So same number of EMG signal, we contaminate them at different level of SNR. So in one experiment, we make the investigation a little easy. Like um, if I have a 7 d minus 7 dB noise level signal, I split some part for training, some part for testing. So, and then similarly for other SNRs. So SNR level, why is they split it? I didn't mix all SNRs and then I didn't split. Rather, I split SNR level. So every single uh, signal here is uh, attenuated by a specific amount. So uh, model for model, it is like minus seven is much harder than of course zero or plus two. So, uh, so plus two is the best case scenario and minus seven is the worst case scenario here. And we split SNL level and that is like the number of training and test samples. And then other one, which we make more complicated problem, because in real world, we don't know 
how much your signal will be corrupted by minus 7 dB or by, by 2 dB. We don't know. That's how you want to feed. Okay. Corrupt them into different amount of SNF and then mix all of them. Then take 80% of the data for training and 20% in the, in the testing. But we made sure that each SNR is present in the test set and each SNR is present in the train set. So model learn about different SNR level and then learn about different uh, tests on the different SNR level. So in this way, this experiment two is a little bit uh, more complicated, but more realistic. So now, what are the performance matrices we actually used in our investigation? Just to show quantitatively. Qualitatively, you can see, okay, this is all my corrupted signal. And I had ground truth. This is my clean signal. You can qualitatively, you can easily assess. But for uh, research, you don't, uh, you are not doing only qualitative alone. You need to show numbers as well, how well your model performed. So we took some matrices like correlation coefficient. So one signal uh, after correction and the original signal, how close they are. So this correlation. And we do it in, uh, then we do also percentage reduction of noise, like one in the time domain, it's called temporal percentage reduction, other one is spectral percentage reduction, which is in the frequency domain, how they are uh, reduced. And then we also calculate relative root mean square error. RMEC is a very popular uh, matrix, but we calculated relative RMEC in temporal domain and also spectral domain. So like if your X is your uh, target and X hat is your uh, predicted one, then you can compare them like this in temporal domain and frequency domain. So look at the result of the first experiment, experiment A. So here uh, you can see all the model performance are not that far. They are very close, pretty close actually, uh, because more, all are deep learning models and uh, all models have similar uh, struggle has similarly struggled with the data set. You can see if you have 2 dB attenuation, 2 dB SNR plus 2 dB SNR, signal is giving almost 95 plus performance uh, correlation coefficient. 95 correlation coefficient means almost you are getting the same signal. Even 85 is very good. So 95 means almost identical signal. So, but when you are uh, going back to the minus 70, it comes down to even 58, 55, 58% correlation. So higher um, attenuation uh, or SNN uh, so in negative direction means signal become very corrupted even the planning model cannot completely identify. Similarly, if you look at the uh, R uh, RRSME, it's an error, the smaller, the better. So here you can see, for minus seven is the highest number, whereas in the you know, plus two is the lowest number, similar for the spectrum. So we can clearly see that if you train the model only on one specific SNR and test it on that SNR, model cannot do well in a higher SNR levels. If you train only on that particular SNR. On the other hand, um, I think this is for the experiment B result. See here, if you look at this is the original data and you can see this this is this part is actually real eeg but this is the noise effect and our model actually managed to reconstruct it so well that the blue and the uh, orange are almost overlapping and you know eeg signal nature is so dynamic and so tiny signal but model can precisely reconstruct the signal so well all of the networks I should not say this one is doing superb, other is not doing that. It's not like that. All are doing somewhat very close perform. And uh, you can see the level of extra is a 10 millivolt, 10 millivolt amplitude here, whereas the ECG may be a few hundreds microvolt, but still model can perform very good. So this is like qualitative assessment. So in quantitative assessment of the class uh, experiment B, you can see all the models are somewhat giving temporal correlation or whatever is 90% uh, correlation. So based on my signal domain experience, I, as I said, 85% above is very good correlation. You can actually almost get good signal. You can see the shape of the signal or, or the morphology of the signal you can follow easily. So you can see if we mix all the different 
SNRs together and then train, model can actually learn different SNRs very well and it can then uh, predict very well your signal and it can then remove, remove the noise uh, for this particular uh, problem easily. So uh, people earlier used to try to um, make their own dynamic signal processing based model to, for a specific type of artifact. But in this problem, although I'm showing only for EMG, but the paper we, uh, under review, uh, we put EMG, ECG, EOG, all artifacts present in one data set. Then model can, independent of the artifact, it can remove everything. So we feel that there's a great potential for, of deep learning algorithms on artifact uh, removing domain, any form. It's not like biological artifact, signal artifact, any, any domain signal artifact seismographic signal or any other signal it can be used so you can see the performance wise then we look okay um, we managed to remove the artifacts whether it still keeping the brain information is still or not because for the doctor it is very important alpha beta gamma these are the delta theta these are the bands of the eeg bands which doctor looks at to understand about the patient's activity or uh, for example, a healthy human should show when they're active, should show specific, for example, beta. Uh, she should not show delta. So that is, if that is showing delta, there is something wrong. So, so that's, that's why these bands are very important to, to the doctors, medical doctors. So we wanted to see, okay, before correction, what was our power on these bands? And after correction, what is the power? Are they close? So you can see, this is the ground truth, power ratio. And whereas this is our prediction. And look at the numbers on the contaminated one. They're very high, like some cases low, some cases high. Uh, but after correction, these yellow lines, if you follow, they are very close to the ground truth. This is ground truth, this is close to ground truth, this is close to ground truth. So we are actually even power level wise, band power level wise, we are very close. So we managed to not only reconstruct the signal, we managed to keep the biological information properly intact. And that's the important thing for the doctor. So in conclusion, so we can say deep learning model can remove actually um, EMG artifacts from the EG signal. And these uh, unit architectures can uh, correct, uh, remove it with uh, like 90% or 95% efficiency in some case, time domain and frequency domain. And uh, lowest RMSE error we got is 0.1 and 0.2, which is quite low. And also important thing we managed to re, uh, like retain the power, uh, band power, which is most importantly, important thing for the doctors. And then finally our uh, remark is, I think take home information is deep learning model should be used for uh, removing motion artifact corrections or any other form of artifact corrections and, uh, from the signal. Uh, it can give a very, very good performance, especially uh, people working with MRI, collecting EEG data inside MRI. Uh, my PhD was in that direction. If I knew it uh, in 2010 about uh, machine learning, deep learning, my PhD work might have been different because uh, we are struggling a lot to remove the artifact from the EEG data inside the MRI machine. But now deep learning is actually showing up a way completely, it's a new direction actually. So these are the people who have worked for this project. Um, thank you very much.